So the first question is from uh, Rekha, and this is probably a good one for um, Ed Raby to answer, but um, it is, do you see antibiotics early in cases of good response? So I guess, you know, do you ever determine the duration of therapy based on the response rather than something arbitrary? Yes, um, I, but I guess still in that four to six week window, um, I think I'd be very reluctant to go any shorter than four weeks with um, uh, when we're treating what we think is osteomyelitis. I guess it's probably more relevant in the um, prolonged, you know, when, when do you prolong? And I think that's really tricky. Um, you know, is there, uh, when, when do you just keep going for longer or when do you actually need to go back and um, review the diagnosis, review the, you know, get more samples and all the rest of it. Um, Lawrence Manning started to do some interesting work looking at decay of CRP um, and seeing, I think it, you know, you, we, we are starting to be able to see who has had an adequate early response and who hasn't. Um, and I think understanding those aspects as well as the clinical signs of response are going to become more useful in terms of guiding duration therapy. Um, yeah. Certainly not a one size fits all question answer. No, me. thank you. And look, you answered my follow on question, which was really about how exactly you know if somebody's responded or not. Yeah, and and I, and you know trying trying to interpret the 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 diabetic foot guidelines. They talk about um, uh, changing the duration therapy based on clinical response. And they, again, in that setting, I think it's really difficult to say who has responded and who hasn't. And um, they give advice about uh, what to do when people have and haven't, but they don't actually define what the good response is. So yeah, definitely some more work to be done in that space. Okay, thanks so much, Ed. Um, the next two questions I'm gonna bunch up and send across to Kate. Uh, they're kind of questions around um, delivery of infusers. And the first is how do you manage issues with BD delivery of infusers? And the second, which is related, is um, about self-administration and the, the kind of the logistics of that. Is that via elastomeric pumps or via electronic devices and so on? If you could just explain a bit about how you do that in your program. Um, so I guess there's only a few drugs that need BD infusion. Most of your workhorse antibiotics require, you know, a 24-hour infusion. So uh, it's only limited to a few. And those are those often more unstable medications that um, many speakers have alluded to. So um, in terms of addressing those, when anyone comes on a program, we really look at what is the right drug and what is the most narrow spectrum drug that we can use. And if we are in a setting where we do need to use the kefepimes, keftazidine, miro or ampicillin, uh, you know, it's not, to be honest, that common. We use a lot of piptazo, which is a 24-hour infusion instead. Um, I guess then we're not really happy to use those drugs without therapeutic drug monitoring, to be honest with you. Um, um, probably keftazidine is an exception, but the other three certainly. And so that, in my mind, limits where you can use those medications because um, I think we're very fortunate to have that access and many services don't have that access. Um, and in terms of you know logistics, I guess, of pr actual provision of the antibiotic, uh, we'll try and if the patient's suitable, we will use our self-connector service. Um, and then if they're not, then we're kind of, um, uh, according to our geographical distribution, you could say we don't have equity <laughs> in that uh, in some parts, but we're able to provide P BD visits and others we're not. Um, but so then we try and get around it with having maybe them coming to the hospital for one dose and then the nurse will go out that night. So, uh, you know, they're logistical things. Um, in terms of our self-administration of antibiotics, um, we choose our cohort very carefully and, and it's our nurses on the team that do that and are trained up to do that. Um, I guess the, the most important thing is the, uh, the patient has to be willing and um, often that's a younger cohort um, and they have to be confident. And so We've actually, one of the beauties of our program is we have a, a, a range of uh, potential ways of administering drugs and that might be either through a pump and a bag um, or it might be through an elastomeric infuser which gives a short or a long infusion and clearly the 
technical difficulty of those is, is slightly different. Um, until recently, we only really had, we were only set up to use pumps and, and bags. And so clearly it had to be a really literate, young, able person. But with that now utilization of, in, of infusers, um, that's starting to expand our program. To be honest with you, in some respects, I think the biggest barrier for me, uh, when I say me, that's incorrect, the program, uh, in terms of that expansion of ability to give it is um, actually staff um, and their expectations of what, uh, you know, the service should provide. Uh, it's quite interesting. So what we often do is we move patients from one program to another. We have separate funding models, unfortunately, um, as, as they become more able, that's another way we do it as well. Uh, fantastic, thanks so much. And just a question from me on that. Do you have a defined um, kind of uh, education and accreditation process for patients before they can self-administer or is it kind of an ad hoc teach them and somebody thinks they're okay type process? Yeah, no, it's, that's a really good point. So we have, um, uh, we have one nurse that does that education and um, there is kind of a defined process for that education. And in a way this is, uh, we actually see whether they're able to do it. So they're kind of flagged as potentially being suitable and willing. And then she goes and sees them and does kind of our standard education. But to be honest, not so standard in the sense that if a patient requires more time, they get it. Um, and then we see how they go. And in some cases, we actually keep people in hospital uh, doing that process for a day or two uh, to make sure they're really able. Um, so um, standardised in some ways, but uh, tailored to the patient, I guess. Yeah, thanks so much. At our end, we actually have a standardised process that we use for the CHIP, CF cohort. And we've tried to um, have that same process used at the various CF hospitals in Melbourne so that if they move between sites, they can um, still kind of carry that accreditation with them. But I guess it's something we could all think about, uh, you know, nationally, about whether we want to think about how to define that self-administration and, and the safety around it. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, these question, this question I'm going to send to uh, Mark and Jason might want to chime in with some local information, but um, it's really about you know, the difference in stability information that we sometimes get from the uh, commercial producer or compounder relative to what's available in the literature um, and, you know, how we interpret this information that comes with the commercial agents or the commercially compounded drugs. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, um, so, yeah, commercial companies have to, um, they have to support uh, the stability of agents, but I think in the past a lot of these agents have been for immediate use and, and certainly a lot of the drugs we have are immediate use and that's what the focus has been on and, and whether or not there's been guidance on how you should do a continuous infusion. The story of continuous infusions have come, as, as you'll know, like over the, over the years after the drugs have already been put to market and got their license. So, you know, it's maybe not in the interest sometimes for drug companies to go back and redo all of their stability studies because of a difference in um, how we administer antimicrobials. And I think that's what we're sort of looking at at the moment. Um, you know, the biggest question probably that hit in, in a global aspect was the keftazidime issue, which really, um, I, I guess from a UK point of view, I feel slightly guilty because we did some of the studies and then it sort of sparked some, um, some interesting discussions. But um, it it really comes down to the fact of have do you trust what the stability data is showing you if you think the context of the original manufacturer's license was not to do what it was intended to now so so you know you have to take it with a pinch of salt um but it was intended for uh, an infusion or it was intended for a, a a bolus and if you look at some of the new gram negative drugs that are coming out they're now for two or three or four or five hour infusions that are coming to market. So the stability data is already starting to be planned for these newer agents. Um, so I, I, I think that's why we need global, con global consensus. Um, it doesn't mean that the drugs are unsafe and we know the principles of a lot of these drugs, um, but it's, it's more the degradation products that I think people are starting to worry about um, and whether or not it's actually valid. So the pyridine with keftazidine does does that actually make a difference or not? I've, I've never seen anybody go toxic with keftazidine. 
so I, I'm slightly going against what the data is showing. So it's um, it's a tricky one. Uh, I tend to agree with what Mark said. I think that it would be great if we had some international consensus on this. Certainly in Australia, there's no uh, strong regulation which describes what um, practitioners should do. And maybe Kate might also want to comment on this as well because of her work that she's done looking at the stability. But um, my observation is in talking to lots of people that there's highly varied practice around the country in terms of what they consider to be uh, an appropriate and justifiable practice for use of some drugs with a, a classic example being meropenem. And uh, I think that each of the people that have the different practices can clinically and uh, from a safety perspective justify what their approach is. But there is always this nagging concern which uh, others may raise to say, well, what about the degradation products? And, um, you know, just like Mark said, I'm not aware of any um, published data which suggests that there are um, adverse effects associated with possible degradation products. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to walk the line between what is a, uh, a pragmatic approach, whereby uh, there may be very few alternative options and uh, another approach which may uh, align with uh, with a very strict regulatory approach, which you know may not necessarily be achievable. Kate, did you have a comment on that as well? Look, I, to be honest with you, I mean, you know, with those drugs where we're not as certain, in some respects, you tend to I tend to avoid them. Um, I try and use things that I feel much safer with, um, and so actually. Uh, maybe controversially, I believe that, uh, you know, it is in drug company interest to actually publish the data that they have uh, because uh, it would certainly make some of those choices and patients uh, easier for the clinician anyway. I'm happy you brought up the uh, keftazidine, Mark, because, you know, as Australian clinicians, you know, we probably had tens of thousands of patients of experience with keftazidine infusions over 24 hours. And uh, due to that new data, we've changed our practice. And I think there hasn't been a lot of unease about it. And you know, maybe in a way the onus was on us to have systematically evaluated and collected the data on those patients as we used it. And you know, if we'd really been able to come back and say, look, this is safe, we've done it for years and years, um, that you know, would have been really useful to have at the time. But I think, I think Ben, that, that provides, the, that's exactly the opportunity that exists, you know, to, to, to really go back and say, actually, if we have this, how do we rank global experience and clinical practice or real world experiences, which is what we, we now all do with an infection. It's, you know, the more coming thing. And, and the thought about the global collaboration is that, okay, if you have the data that says 90, 95%, okay, you might class that as a, you know, gold standard for want of a better word. But if you have, you know, years of experience of a drug with no negative um, degradation products or unintended consequences, you might put that in the silver category, um, but it's still a valid mode of delivery. And it, it's just how we can classify those. Cause I think there's, there's an equilibrium we can reach about complete gold standard of got, you've got the evidence, real world evidence that you've got and patient data and years of experience and what does that show and then another bucket and I think if we can do that it will it will allow us to have a more global reach and global harmonization of that so I I am I, completely with you with my clinical hat on I'm like loads of people around the world are doing this and then when you start to actually unpick and scratch the surface and look at the data you go mm, maybe this this isn't all as good as we think it is Thank you. Thanks. Um, Kate, this question's for you, and it's really about that comment you made about whether you need to modify the dose of vancomycin between intermittent dosing and continuous infusion. Uh, some guidelines, and it's commented here that the South Australian guidelines, and in fact, our local guidelines at our hospital sort of suggested, suggested dose reduction. So how do you approach that? Um, so I guess um, uh, a reference would be the, the ETG. Certainly the ETG no longer recommends um, 
dose um, reduction um, when you change to an infusion and you use the doses you've used in the last 24 hours. But I guess to probably put that in context, it really depends where your patient's sitting with their trough levels before you move on to the service. So if you're, and so you should adjust it accordingly. So you could argue that your starting dose would be what they've had in the last 24 hours. And then you could look where they're sitting and if their level's too high for your target, you might reduce or if your level's um, too low, you might increase your dose. So I think um, perhaps uh, we've become a little bit more sophisticated and we're adjusting it um, to the patient instead of a global dose reduction or globally um, leaving it the same is the way I'd view it. Uh, thanks so much. Um, maybe Ed, you can answer the next question. This is really just about the types of devices you can get that can provide a shorter infusion, a 30 minute or one hour infusion. I'm not sure if you know that or we can hand it on. There's certainly, I mean, there's the, there is a Baxter product, which is um, just got a higher flow rate. So the standard um, uh, 24 hour infuser infuses 240 mils at 10 mils an hour for 24 hours. So there's a, I think an Intimate, which is a, um, a faster flow rate. And we've used those um, before we had the Keftalazone stability data, we use those to deliver three times a day um, self-administration of Keftalazone. Um, and we've used them for amphotericin in the past as well. Um, I'm sure there's other small devices as well, but that's one that I'm familiar with. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm always amazed at the vast number of devices that you can actually get when you start looking around the market and pretty much anything you want to do, you can almost find a device to, to do. Um, so the next, next question is for Nicolette um, and it's, I guess a question about uh, the use of citrate buffers in paediatrics um, and whether there are any concerns about citrate and the dose of citrate and uh, monitoring electrolytes in kids that are receiving a buffered solution in OPAT. Thanks for the question, Ben, and um, whoever posted it. Um, it's definitely something that we do consider. Um, I was trying to think of a case where we actually had to make adjustments for a patient because they were symptomatic um, and I couldn't think of one in my last seven years of doing HIP. However, I would say as a general rule, babies under six months of age, uh, babies with cardiac conditions and then children with end-stage liver or renal disease would be the ones where I would do some additional monitoring in particular. Um, our patients on um, HIF or OPAT would get baseline bloods done and we would normally monitor them minimum weekly, sometimes twice weekly, depending on the drug or the buffering agent that we use. Um, but mainly our monitoring would be around calcium in particular. Um, very rarely and probably more so in the ICU setting in patients on citrate-based um, dialysis products, I've seen citrate um, lock phenomenon, but not something that I've come across in a HIF. Um, setting in peds. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now, I don't think there could be a, a seminar of any sort on bone and joint infections that doesn't ask a question about rifampicin. Um, so maybe this can be for um, Ed as a start. Um, and it's where do you draw the line in rifampicin use? Is it for all gram positives, only for staphylococcus? You've frozen there, Ben, but I think the um, question is relatively clear. The answer is not. And um, we, the, the rifampicin data in any setting is, I think, fairly shaky. Um, and the, there's a randomised control trial that's just been published in the last week or, or the last month or so. Um, that I think was originally presented a couple of years ago, which um, is a negative study for rifampicin in uh, following uh, debridement and implant retention. Um, so that opens that up to um, further study. Um, so I think it's not clear whether there's actually benefit in that setting as yet. Um, there's also the um, American uh, VA Intrepid study, which has just started recruiting um, into a rifampicin uh, versus placebo for uh, chronic osteomyelitis and diabetic foot infection. Um, 
there's theoretical and animal model data to suggest it works in that setting. Um, and there's some good Spanish data where they use it frequently with a quinolone um, for sort of MRSA infections more generally. So as I, um, I use it, but have a very low threshold for pulling out and using something else. Um, I use it in prosthetic joint infection and that's about it. Um, for everything else, I'll try and find something that's a bit more palatable. Um, I personally use a lot of doxycycline and I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but I use a lot of doxycycline in combination. Um, so doxy and cipro and uh, or doxy alone for bone infection. Uh, thanks so much. That's great. I guess rifampicin for us has been one of those things that we've rethought in COVID because it's not PBS uh, supported and patients have to get it from a hospital, which is is getting increasingly difficult now. Um, so the next question uh, is for Nicolette, and it's really about uh, the experience using keftazidine elastomeric infusers, uh, potentially once daily in paediatrics and, and what your approach is. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, it's really interesting. I was just reflecting on Mark's um, response earlier around kiftazanin, and it's so true. We, um, even though we know that there's byproduct formation, we don't know what that means in humans. We don't know what the toxicity um, effects are. There's a lot of um, studies that report animal data and then the human data mainly around inhalational exposure rather than systemic exposure in terms of parenteral exposure. So to answer your question, um, the uh, infusion opt uh, optimization data that I presented was all done on keptazidine continuous infusions. And certainly anecdotally during that period of time when we introduced the continuous infusions for keptaz, we didn't have any reports of patient adverse effects that we could really attribute to either therapy. Um, but that wasn't done in a randomised control setting. So I think the jury is out. Um, our CF team, um, in consultation with our patient safety service, felt that the data didn't support continuous infusions, and so we changed to a modified HIF model for that reason. Um, but certainly, if there is clinical data that supports safety, um, I'm sure that we would be very happy to move back to uh, once daily continuous infusion. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Now uh, we're getting towards the end of our session, so I might just skip a few questions and I might um, go to this question about um, keptolazine tazobactam and I might send it to Mark as a start. Um, and it's really about any experience in the use of the agent for bone and joint infections and how you've used it in an OPAT setting and what dosing you've used. Um, so easy, quite easy answer is that we haven't used it in OPAT yet. Um, um, so that we have used, um, I, I should say, we have used other new fourth and fifth generation keflosporins in the OPAT um, sphere, but we haven't used keftolazine taser yet, mainly because the um, the stability data we only just sort of finished that finish that off. So I suspect it will be something that we do use. Um, we um, at the moment for bone and joint, when we've used it in an inpatient setting, we've not gone higher than one point five. So we've kept it at the 1.5 uh, eight hourly. Thanks. Now, I'm sure Ed can answer this question. He's published on this. So do you want to add something to that as well? Yes, I, I mean, when I've, used, I've used it for minus, and we have pushed it up to the higher dose and used uh, nine grams a day. So three, yeah, equivalent of three grams TDS, both as um, uh, intermittent and more recently as a continuous infusion as well. And is that uh, infuser changed every 12 hours or 24 hours? So 24 hour, yeah. 24 hour stability, fantastic. Should we keep going with a few more questions, Jason, or do we need to wrap up the session now? Uh, I'd like to wrap up, but just after one more question, which one panelist has for another. And mm -hmm. sometimes these are always uh, interesting. So this is from, from Kate to Mark. Kate, I might as well let you ask it rather than put words in your mouth, if that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I'm, I'm just quite interested. Like, so when I read the European or UK literature, they talk about a lot about nurse practitioners uh, in um, OPAT. And I guess in the Australian setting, 
nurse practitioners um, have gone through additional training, um, you know, to get to get that title. Um, how does that work in your sector? What roles do they do? Um, what training do they have? I think it's a really great idea. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, most of the um, so I guess it's evolving. Most of the OPAT nurses have, or hospital and home nurses have evolved in secondary care. So they've all been secondary care based um, with skills around um, cannulation. Um, and then they have developed in a hospital setting to pick up the, the skills and the trade around how to manage these OPAT patients in general. Um, in the UK, the majority of OPAT nurses don't don't work in primary care so they don't go out into the community they they stay within secondary care and go through a number of other qualifications if that's vascular access insertion so our opat nurses for example will put in all our lines and they'll do all the um, imaging requests etc and manage that through further qualifications um, there's no set pathway in a sense it's um, we train people up and have competencies and mentorship programs within our own OPAT services. And nationally, um, we are trying to develop those competency-based assessments for OPAT nurses, pharmacists, and medics within the UK, so that people actually have an idea about what the competencies are needed to run a successful OPAT program. But there's no formal um, training. It's more individual hospital-based training that, that people get. Thanks, thanks Mark. so much. Okay. Jason, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Congratulations to Ben for expert chairing again. Uh, he does a fantastic job with this and um, I'm really grateful for his support with this. And a big thanks to the, the speakers in each of the time zones that they're in. I think uh, you know, there's some fascinating presentations. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed all of them and uh, the question and answer was fantastic as well. Great engagement from all the attendees. I, I noticed that I noted there were over 100 participants that were participating throughout the webinar and of course there will be availability for uh, them, those presentations to be uh, looked at again through the YouTube channel which uh, CRE Reduce has. I know that we did miss out on a couple of questions and uh, I guess that's part and parcel with having such an interesting topic for discussion and that's um, and so whilst we're sorry about that, we would like to offer you the opportunity to just send an email to uh, Luminita or myself and we can direct those on to the, the, the speakers to provide answers to those questions. But uh, thank you everyone for your attendance tonight. It was a, a very interesting and um, an exciting webinar and we look forward to you joining us again for the next iteration of the OPAT Masterclass, which will be on the topic of OPAT for cancer patients. So thank you, have a great evening, great afternoon or great day. <laughs>